Hello, Dr. Jung. Um, this is um, Amitabh Ghosh. Um, I'm a Mars scientist um, based out of Washington, D.C. Um, I was the Science Operation Working Group Chair for, for the Mars Exploration Rover mission. Um, it's my pleasure to be in this discussion with you. Mars has been a very special planet for the human race. For um, hundreds of years, uh, human beings have been fascinated by Mars. Maybe it started with the discovery of canals, what we thought canals um, maybe 400 years ago. Um, and then it continued with our fascination of, with Mars in terms of um, science fiction. So science fiction brought this idea of Mars where little teen men are roaming around and there is a companion life form to Earth. So, so this was the past. And in the very recent times, if you remember um, in 1996, so, you know, I was a young graduate student and, you know, we used to discuss, um, could life um, survive in a meteorite that is brought to earth? And around that same time in 1996, there was the huge outcry about a meteorite picked up from, um, Antarctica, which came from Mars, which showed some purportedly nano fossils. And so everybody was fascinated. Um, so there was, it was on the front pages of most newspapers. Mars is a place where at least microscopic life could have existed. And so the very fact that, you know, we look up at the sky and there are a um, trillion, trillion stars which is one followed by 24 zero stars. And what is, the ex what is the possibility that only Earth has life? And so could Mars be a place where there could be life as well? I think that is what drove the average science enthusiast or the average person um, around the world um, to this allure of Mars. So I think we are still there. And, and at that point in 1996, if you ask me what are the chances of finding life on Mars, I would have um, said that it's very little. But now um, this intervening 25 years of discovery uh, has shown Mars to be a much Earth-like planet. And at least it was an Earth-like planet maybe uh, 4 billion years ago when it formed. So it's, a, it's very fascinating when Mars and Earth formed around 4.5 billion years ago, um, both uh, formed around the same time, you know, maybe the sun formed 100 billion years before, and then both these we call terrestrial planets formed. Um, the fascinating thing was Earth was very volcanic and very hot, and it could not have su supported life. But Mars, in contrast, had a lot of water, which meant that there was like an Earth-like condition on Mars, the, like the present Earth-like condition. There were catastrophic floods, there were rivers, there were oceans. Um, and so today, if you ask me, I think there's a much greater possibility of finding life on Mars. And the second reason for that is, um, in 1996, we had no idea that life could e exist in extreme environments. So since then, there has been studies which have shown that life can exist, for example, in, in um, hydrothermal vents below the ocean where the uh, temperatures are very high, or it can exist in Antarctic ice cores. So life doesn't need a very comfortable environment. It, can, do, it does exist in very hostile environments. So, if Mars um, had a hostile environment, it may still be able to harbor past life or maybe even present life. So, um, so I think that is what the, the public and the scientists are excited by, the possibility of finding life. And if we do find life, it will change um, a lot of things that the human race thinks about itself. For starters, we are no longer the sole 
occupants of the universe, this a companion life form um, across just six months away. So um, one of the um, questions um, I, uh, I would, I li like Dr. Jung's question uh, that is Mars the past or the future? And I think it's a fascinating question. And I think we are all trying to understand that. So what has changed in the um, last maybe 10 years is space travel has become affordable primarily because of SpaceX and Elon Musk um, uh, developing reusable vehicles and different strategies to um, uh, lowered the cost. So the journey to Mars, um, maybe if you ask me 20 years back uh, with human beings would have taken maybe uh, $500 billion or maybe even a trillion dollars. Today, um, Elon Musk and Starship, uh, are they, uh, sorry, Elon Musk and SpaceX are developing this uh, vehicle called Starship, which will um, perhaps lower the cost to a few million dollars, which is huge. A few million dollars is probably, you know, the cost of taking an airplane or a Boeing 747 between Washington and Beijing a few times. So it's a very, very affordable, perhaps a 1000% decrease in cost or even more. Um, so that changes the game completely. And um, there would still have been skeptics who would have said, well, the Starship development will take time, it's not going well, but you know, it is going well. And uh, in, in June, he will test this vehicle um, for the first time, uh, um, take it to orbit. And then perhaps by next year, they will take this vehicle, test it, uh, by sending it to the moon. And my estimate is by the end of this decade, we will have a human mission to Mars on the starship. So that is where the fascinating question lies, is Mars the past or the future? And I think it's the future. So once you can economically transport humans to Mars, then the problem of staying there is not as difficult. People stay in Antarctica here um, uh, in 365 days a year um, for many, many years. So all you need is a habitation module. You need a, a pressure and temperature controlled environment, which is which shields from um, cosmic rays. And then you need uh, probably a water, a source of water for human needs and source of oxygen, um, which, um, the last rover mission showed that you could um, make oxygen on Mars. So, so once this reliable transportation and not just reliable, affordable transportation uh, develops, then there'll be much more um, going back and forth between Earth and Mars. Uh, there will be perhaps a, a scientific base on Mars um, so this is absolutely going to happen in the next 20 years. Now, beyond that, will there be commercial activity on Mars? That is what we don't know. See, you see, to get commercial activity on Mars, one of two things has to happen. Either an average person on Earth will say that, well, I will take a lifetime, once in a lifetime vacation to Mars for say $100,000 or even $50,000. So that is one way. So there'll be many, many tens of thousands of people who will take this trip. And so that will create an industry. The other is, is there any mineral or material on Mars which we need on Earth, but it's very, very expensive. Um, so it is almost cheaper to get it from Mars. So for example, you know, um, yesterday um, I had, um, say, uh, lamb, and it came in from Australia, but it came in through this very economical sea route on a ship. And so it was still economically competitive to 
buy something from Australia in contrast to getting something from um, say a farm nearby. So in, in similar case, I'm giving you an example. So you say you need nickel to make electric vehicles uh, and the cost of nickel right now is probably more than $110,000 per ton. Now, if you can get this nickel from Mars, and I'm not at all implying that you can, uh, at a much cheaper price, then it would make sense. But I think we are very far away from uh, getting minerals from Mars or even from asteroids. So I think after 10 or 20 years, after we have this permanent scientific base on Mars, paid for by taxpayers, that um, we will uh, probably stagnate and be there for a while. Because one of the things about Mars is, uh, I think people do not understand, it's very different going to this um, International Space Station, um, which is just 200 miles away or 250 miles away, and going to the moon, which is less than half a million miles away, to Mars, which is more than 200 million miles away. So it takes three days to go to the moon, um, it takes a few hours to go to the International Space Station, but it takes seven months to go to Mars, that to when it's on the same side of the sun as Earth, and it could be on the other side of the um, sun. So, so that is one of the main drawbacks um, uh, of why uh, eventual plan of settling on Mars might not exist, succeed. Uh, and the other drawback is, um, I think um, if the human body is not adapted for either low gravity um, journeys or no gravity situations. And so our body does not hold up well. So there is no easy answer. See, all these astronauts who go, they can stay there for maximum maybe one year or six months. It's, it's not a comfortable situation. But to go to Mars and come back, you will need probably um, one year, six months, or even more. So how will the human body physically withstand this? Or even more importantly, how will we mentally um, absorb this huge um, isolation. See, humans, after all, are social creatures. So if you put them in a can and you send them to space, then after a while, your mind will um, react and will not be, not be fine. So that's, I think these are the hurdles that the human race will finally have to come to terms with when they want to reach out to the to the to outer space and start traveling within the solar system